Um, so we'll wait until the time moves on to one o'clock. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. First of all, I welcome Mr. David Bertzor, and he will defend his thesis in public, uh, and his thesis is called Inflammatory Actions of Chemokines and Extracellular Vesicles in Pathological Tissue Remodeling. Uh, I welcome all the members of the degree committee, and in particular, the three uh, supervisors, and they are uh, Professor Tilman Hacking. He's a uh, professor in biochemistry at Maastricht University. The second supervisor is uh, Dr. Rory Koene. He is associate professor also at the Department of Biochemistry at Maastricht University. And the third supervisor, the co-supervisor, is uh, Professor Rafael Kraman. Um, he works at the Institute for Experimenten in the Medicine on Systembiology at the Uniklinik at the Rheinisch Westfälische Technische Hochschule Aachen University. Um, I will introduce the six opponents uh, somewhat later during the ceremony, during the opposition. I welcome the audience, uh, the followers of the live stream. May I invite you to give a summary of your dissertation? Please go ahead. And please unmute your microphone. Of course. Dear Prorector, thank you for the nice words. And right now, let me share you my uh, PhD presentation with you. May you confirm whether you see the presentation in the full screen? No, it's not full screen. Yeah. We, we yeah, ran in this issue in the previous session, so let me share it again. I hope that this works. Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Let me start. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and audience. In the next 15 minutes, I will shortly describe my PhD project entitled Inflammatory Actions of Chemokines and Extracellular Vesicles in Pathological Tissue Remodeling. Since my PhD research focuses mainly on cardiovascular disease, I would like to begin with describing the structure of the blood vessels. Arteries consist of three layers called tunica intima, mainly endothelial cells, tunica media, smooth muscle cells, and tunica externa, connective tissue. In vasculature, endothelial cells are constantly in contact with blood components like platelets and vascular smooth muscle cells can interact with them upon vessel injury or damage. Arterial remodeling um, refers to a variety of structural and functional changes of the vascular wall that occur in response to disease, injury, or aging. Mechanisms involved in arterial remodeling include endothelial dysfunction, phenotype switching, and migration, changes in vascular collagen elastin leading to fibrosis, arterial calcification and extracellular vesicle release. 
pathological remodeling can eventually lead to cardiovascular complication and myocardial infarction or stroke. Extracellular vesicles play an important role in cell-to-cell -cell communication in physiological and pathological conditions. Current nomenclature distinguishes three populations of EVs based on size, exosomes, microvesicles, and apoptotic bodies that differ in content and type of secretion. In particular, the secretion of EVs by platelets require three key elements, integrin activation, phosphatidylserine exposure, and cytoskeletal rearrangements. The increased platelet EVs levels have been shown to be augmented in various cardiovascular diseases. Even though platelets are associated mainly with blood coagulation, they also participate in vessel remodeling. Platelet EVs contain molecules involved in atherosclerosis and calcification, such as chemokines CCL5 and CXCL4 that are the subject of this thesis, pro-inflammatory cytokines, growth factor stimulating proliferation, cell adhesion molecules facilitating cell arrest, regulators of immune response, enabling leukocyte interactions, protein involved in coagulation, and many more. Vascular smooth muscle cells are considered to be one of the key players in the development of atherosclerosis. Normally, those cells retain in their quiescent contractile state, but in response to pathological signals undergo phenotypic switching characterized by the expression of uh, bone-related uh, proteins and uh, the release of calcifying extracellular vesicles that are the first needles for the calcium phosphate crystal formation. Chemokines, in turn, are, are small proteins that are rapidly released upon activation and can control the trafficking of leukocytes during inflammation. Generally, chemokine nomenclature reflects sustained residues and disulfide bonds rearrangements, what results in four classes of chemokines. Upon injury and during atherosclerosis, platelets secrete chemokines such as CXCL4, known as platelet, four, platelet factor 4 and PR4 for short, CXCL4L1, which is also called PA4L, and CCL5 or RANTAS which are the subject of my thesis. Interestingly, those two proteins, uh, there are three amino acids different between major proteins that affect the 3D structure of the, uh, these molecules, resulting in distinct physiological properties. Since the presence of PF4 and its colocalization with calcification was previously found in atherosclerotic plaques, in my thesis, I studied the effect of these uh, chemokines on phenotype and function of vascular smooth muscle cells. In this slide, I show you the immunocytochemical analysis that revealed that vascular smooth muscle cells internalize native exogenous platelet factor 4, which appeared as a dotted pattern suggesting endosomal localization. Interestingly, staining with PFR-specific antibody revealed a baseline level of intracellular expression. So these results suggest that the variant of PF factor 4 out is constitutively expressed by those cells and only exogenously native PF4 is internalized by them. Next, we investigated the involvement of membrane receptors in chemokine uptake. Although a significantly increased endocytosis of PF4 was demonstrated, this was not affected by the incubation with blocking antibodies against receptors CR3 and DARK, what excludes their role in PF4 endocytosis. Then the LDL receptors were investigated. The addition of RAP, a well-established blocker of these receptors, decreased PF4 uptake what confirms the involvement of those receptors in the process. Similar to the previous results, there was virtually no PF4 alt uptake under any condition. 
to investigate whether PF4 and PF4 alt affect the phenotype of vascular smooth muscle cells on a molecular level, qPCR analysis was performed. And the data showed that the expression of contractile markers such as calponin and alpha smooth muscle actin were significantly lower after treatment with both chemokines. On the other hand, mRNA levels of the transcription factors involved in phenotype change and inflammation such as KLF4 and NLRP3 were significantly higher. Thus, we proved that both chemokines direct those cells towards synthetic phenotype, which is detrimental in atherosclerosis. To further confirm the involvement on vascular smooth muscle cells in cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis, we performed proliferation and calcification assays. Consistent with previous studies, only native PF4 stimulated proliferation of cells in a dose-dependent manner, what confirms its stimulatory properties. In another experiment, we showed that the addition of native PF4 at higher concentration increased the calcification of cultured cells by approximately 50%, whereas its variant did not have an effect. So to, to summarize this chapter, we could say that while uh, PF4 alt is constitutively expressed by vascular smooth muscle cells, exogenous PF4 is rapidly internalized via LDL receptors and both chemokines uh, drive synthetic phenotype of vascular smooth muscle cells, whereas only native PF4 increases proliferation and calcification of those cells. In the next chapter, we investigated the interaction of two platelet-derived chemokines, platelet factor 4 and CCL5, with endothelial cells that line the interior surface of blood vessel, whose dysfunction is involved in development of atherosclerosis. In order to investigate the mechanisms of the uptake, endothelial cells were pretreated with inhibitors of clatrin and dynamin mediated classical endocytosis, as well as the antagonist of G protein coupled receptors. The blockage of aforementioned proteins led to a reduced internal presence of both uh, chemokines, what can be seen as a lack of red fluorescence in the micrographs. This indicates that both chemokines are internalized via clatrin and dynamin dependent endocytosis, as well as GPCR receptors. Next, we investigated the interdependency of PF4 and CCL5 during endocytosis. Pre incubation of the cells with CCL5 prior to PF4 did not affect PF4 uptake, as shown on the left. Remarkably, pre-incubation of the cells with PF4 blocked CCL5 entry to the cell, what indicates PF4 ability to desensitize endothelial cells for subsequent uptake of other chemokines. Then we further explored the intracellular fate of those chemokines. Interestingly, confocal microscopic pictures on the left indicated that the chemokines accumulated in the nucleus. These observations were also confirmed by analysis of subcellular fractions where both chemokines showed an association with the cytoskeleton as well. The meaning of the fact that CCL5 and PF4 are transported to the nucleus through cytoskeletal associations is unknown but it is tempting to speculate about their active involvement in transcriptional processes. Previous findings suggested that chemokines stored in vesicles under endothelial cell membrane could, give, could guide lymphocyte tracking, uh, and we also tested this hypothesis. In our hands, the addition of chemokines did not affect monocyte adhesion to cells. Similar results were observed after activation of cells with pro-inflammatory tumor necrosis factor alpha. And the combination of CCL5 and PF4, which is a potent stimulus for monocyte arrest. Overall, this result suggests that at least 
CCL5 and PF4 require surface presentation for leukocyte recruitment. And to summarize this chapter, we could say that both CCL5 and PF4 are rapidly internalized by endothelial cells via classical endocytosis and accumulate in the nucleus, not causing leukocyte adhesion to endothelial cells. Then, metabolic associated fatty liver disease is a leading cause of liver transplantation. Lipid accumulation by hepatocytes leads to liver steatosis that further progress, progresses to non alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH, cirrhosis, and finally hepatocellular carcinoma. Key pathological steps are the activation of transdifferentiation and hepa of hepatic stellate cells. Here we hypothesize that hepatic derived extracellular vesicles modify the phenotype of stellate cells. In this experiment, hepatocytes were stressed with fatty acids and their steatotic phenotype can be appreciated in micrograms with oil red staining. While under normal condition, hepatocytes released considerable amounts of EVs after treatment with fatty acids, the secretion was mo more pronounced. Moreover, Western blood analysis confirmed the presence of exosome markers such as ALIX, TSG101, or Sintanin. Generally, the activation of hepatic stellate cells to my mitogenic response leads to mitogenic responses. Indeed, after hepatocyte-derived fatty acid EV treatment, we observed increased proliferation of the cells. In a Boyden chamber setup, hepatic stellate cells were allowed to migrate towards the serum from healthy individuals and those with clinically diagnosed NASH. Interestingly, only patient SERA were able to induce cell migration. Similarly, fatty acid EVs and not control EVs triggered chemotactic migration, what proves the stimulatory properties of fatty acid EVs. Activated hepatic stellate cells undergo transdifferentiation and gain a myofibroblast like phenotype that is associated with the synthesis and release of collagen and matrix remodeling factors. In our experiments, after fatty acid EV treatment, the fraction of elongated cells as well as the expression levels of alpha smooth muscle actin, GFAP, or vimentin were significantly enhanced. In line with these results, we proved that the expression of the matrix remodeling markers, TIMP1 and MMP2, were also significantly higher. Overall, the data suggests that the cells indeed acquired a myofibroblast phenotype, playing an important role in the liver disease. So to summarize this, we could say that hepatocytes stressed by fatty acid excess can transmit signals through EVs to hepatic stellate cells which may facilitate the transformation of resting stellate cells to active myofibroblasts and thus promote initiation and progression of the fibrogenic process during NASH. So general conclusions. First, the two variants of platelet factor 4 and platelet factor 4 out differently affect vascular smooth muscle cells in vitro. Second, endothelial cells internalize CCL5 and PF4 by clattering and dynamin dependent endocytosis, where the chemokines appear to be directed to the nucleus. And third, extracellular vesicles from steatotic hepatocytes provoke profibrotic responses in stellate cells. Thank you for your attention, and I will now give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. The opposition will be opened by the chair of the thesis assessment committee, Professor Joost Lumens. He is professor of biomedical engineering at Maastricht University. Professor Lumens. Thank you, dear prorector. Um, dear candidate, first of all, congratulations with uh, reaching this day. And uh, 
putting everything so nicely together in a thesis and with you, congratulations to the supervisory team as well. Let me quickly go to my question. I would like to ask you um, to read out loud proposition nine, if you have it available there. <clears throat> Cardiovascular disease is one of the main causes of death worldwide and despite extensive research is best prevented by maintaining the healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Well, well, you know, some people, I initially thought this is quite an open door, of course, but I'm sure you have your reasons to, um, to put this as a proposition in your list. So reflecting on your work of the past years and the content of your thesis, could you advise me how to um, better my lifestyle, maybe uh, having a role for the platelet factors as well? What should I change or take into account? Yeah, so first of all, uh, it is worth to mention that cardiovascular disease is one of the lead or is the leading cause of uh, deaths and one third of deaths worldwide is associated with cardiovascular diseases. Uh, and those diseases are multifactorial. So there are multiple factors involved and there is some... No, I, that, that, there's, there's whole, whole books written about this. I just, I, I would like to challenge you and ask you, is there something related to CXCL4, for example, that I could change in my diet um, to maybe neutralize its bad effects? I want my vascular smooth muscle cells to stay in the media. Yeah, that's correct. But then uh, platelet factor four is not necessarily uh, a bad player in the cardiovascular disease because it plays, it could play a good role and a bad role. I showed the, the bad role here, uh, but then of course we have to remember that platelet factor four is released by platelets and its main function is basically to help uh, coagulation of blood, right? So it facilitates the coagulation by also um, interacting with negatively charged phospho uh, phospholipids or heparin, heparin-like molecules. So okay. uh, PF4, um, in this case is a good player, but also I show that indeed uh, under specific circumstances, it can be detrimental. So it can lead to uh, proliferation, migration uh, and calcification of vascular smooth muscle cells. So basically all okay. those steps uh, that are involved in the development of atherosclerosis among, among others. Right. So, uh, so those so are the usual suspects of lifestyle changes that I probably already know. I was just wondering. Okay, thank you. Um, then I would like to move on with uh, a more uh, concrete question to your chapter four, where uh, in the methods on page 66, you mentioned that the cells were uh, have an origin of a patient of which you have a biopsy of the aortic wall, right? Yes. Then I see four uh, data points, usually in the, in, the, in the figures. I assume I assume those are different cell lines, are they? Uh, which graph are we talking about exactly? Well, entire chapter four. Okay, so, so the cells that I used in this chapter were primary uh, vascular smooth muscle cells isolated uh, from patients that are undergoing surgery. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I must say that this indeed is the limitation of the study that the cells were used only, uh, were isolated only from one patient. So what do you uh, expect this could have, what kind of consequence could that have if you would take three more patients similar clinical phenotype, but how would, you know, the course of life have affected your results potentially? Yeah, so we also uh, saw a lot of um, inconsistencies between patients, uh, between cells that were isolated from different patients. And this is, uh, I would say, a normal thing for uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. For people who are working with those cells, they know that they uh, show those um, high um, inconsistency. And it is not 
impossible that if I took another the cells from another patient, I would obtain a little bit different results. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, we uh, try to stress this uh, in our paper. Okay. Um, of course. So may it- I may I ask another questions related to this? Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm interrupting you, but. I want to get to maybe more um, uh, 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 more um, advanced techniques. So you know that at the Cardiovascular Research Institute and Mastic now there is hugely invested in an IPS uh, cell lab. If yes. you would redo your work, would you consider that? If yes, why? And if not, why not? Or you stick to your more traditional way of um, investigating this? Yeah, so you, so you are referring to the idea that I could um, make vascular smooth muscle cells out of iPSCs. Yes. Yes, that is a way to go. And uh, as you are perhaps aware, there are some uh, actions in our department uh, in order to uh, enabling such a streamline. Um, but then we are not there yet. Uh, I think this is, this is a, a possible approach to use in the future mm-hmm. uh, because it, we have shown, so, so my colleagues at the department already showed that uh, they are able to induce uh, vascular smooth muscle cells uh, deriving from iPSC. So definitely that's the possibility, but, and they are expressing uh, vascular smooth muscle cell related uh, markers uh, so we can be uh, sure or almost sure that they become vascular smooth muscle cells in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, they are also, they would be easier to grow and to obtain more, um, more uh, number, the higher number of cells, because we know that the primary cells are very, Mm-hmm. tricky to culture and of course there's a limited number we we can only passage them for a couple of times and then we have to throw them away so uh, really this is another uh, limitation of uh, okay. in vitro okay. studies yes and very short question only an answer yes or no yeah please um so um what do you think about the maturity of those cells is this um an issue for your um studies that they're by far not as mature? Yes or no? So you refer to, to the passage number and how, yeah. how mature they are. In, of no, course. The, the maturity of the cells, of the IPS cells. Anyway, I think we, we will have to move on to the next um, yeah, opponent. For a very or, short answer. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So. <laughs> I will. I uh, thank you for your answers, and I hand back the, the word to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lumens. Uh, the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Norbert Gerdes. He is professor of experimental cardiology at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, Germany. Professor Gerdes. Yeah, thank you, um, um, Mr. Cox. Thank you very much for, for the, your presentation and for your for sharing your thesis actually with me and congratulate for assembling such a nice uh, nice assembly actually of, of data. I am particularly concerned and interested in the function or, or the, the effect of the chemokines you are investigating, CCL5, CXCL4 and CXCL4L1, uh, the alternative form of platelet factor 4. So you're focusing very much on endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells, but can you also speculate how this set of chemokines or each of these chemokines actually functions on other cells related to, uh, to atherosclerosis and how that should be addressed in your, in your research question? Well, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the nice words. Uh, and of course, there. Uh, so it is known that uh, both Rantas, so CCL5 and um, platelet factor 4, uh, they exert effects on many cells in the vasculature. So as you mentioned, endothelial cells, vascular smooth muscle cells that I uh, was investigated, uh, but also, for example, monocytes. 
uh, so uh, it is known that in monocytes um, they are um, able to induce uh, the production of uh, reactive oxygen species for example that was uh, by the way linked to uh, uh, induction of calcification proce process, which is important in atherosclerosis. Uh, then we know that beta factor four uh, is able to uh, affect the transcriptional ma machinery of uh, monocytes. And then um, and they, the perfect uh, beta factor four and also PF4 out, they were able to skew them to more pro inflammatory phenotypes. So uh, they induced monocytes to produce uh, cytokines such as IL-6 or IL-1 beta. Uh, so will, will, will that be, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but, but that's, that's a job here also a little bit. Uh, so the, would, would this affect, the overall effect you see of uh, CCL, CXCL4 or CXCL4L1 produce a, a monocyte uh, phenotype that in turn can affect uh, smooth muscle cells also to, uh, to, to generate a pro-calcific phenotype? Is that, is that the case or can, do you have data or insight on that? Uh, so how uh, PF4 affects monocytes that then affect smooth muscle cells, right? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> So that's a layered question. Um, well, what, what I know is that PF4 in both, uh, in both cell types, they induce um, the foam cell uh, phenotypic switching. So basically uh, they affect LDL. So they do not allow LDL, native LDL to go into the cell thereby uh, allowing uh, oxidation, which is uh, then uh, important again in the development of atherosclerosis. On top of that, uh, both uh, variants are able to uh, bind uh, oxidized LDL in the circulation and then uh, facilitate their uptake, which is uh, basically uh, the uh, reason for the foam uh, cell uh, uh, but would it, would it, would a foam cell make uh, a smooth muscle cell or the general phenotype of a foam cell or the vicinity of a foam cell would that make a smooth muscle cell let's say pro fibrotic or pro calcific or what 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 is a prototypical mediator to make a smooth muscle cell like not the ones you are looking at but maybe some other cytokines or growth factors what makes makes smooth muscle cells to become pro calcific uh, so what we know is that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, IL-6, IR-1-beta, they were already shown to uh, be involved in these processes. And I must also add that vascular smooth muscle cells themselves can become uh, foam cells, right? So, uh, and mm -hmm. then uh, monocytes can also facilitate the, this process, for example, by uh, also uh, excreting uh, the extracellular vesicles that also can uh, contain a specific cargo that facilitate this process. Okay, and, and the, 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 the pathways you investigate in, in chapter four and five, which phase of the disease do you think these are mo most pertinent uh, to? Can you, can you um, give us some, some, your opinion on that? So I would say that it's, uh, in, so I investigated, uh, for example, the involvement of the certain receptors in the process. So this is definitely important for the uh, initial step of the disease. And if you want to uh, find another candidate uh, drugs, then we have to really understand uh, which receptors play a role in this uh, particular process and in the uptake of the chemokines. Uh, Chemokines are also tricky in, in, in this uh, sense that they can multimerize, uh, they can form uh, multimers uh, and oligomers as well. But it is not, uh, uh, it is also well known that um, receptors can multimerize as well, which adds another layer of complexity 
to the um, to this field. So um, that's uh, that's the thing. Okay, and I have a last question for you. Is this so? This this um, this function that um, the chemo the chemokine system of six Cl four and six uh, Cl4, L1 have on, on smooth muscle cells. You investigated this mostly in in human in, in a human cell system. Is this also is this actually happening in a similar way or is, do, do does a mouse smooth muscle cell have all the factors it needs to, to react in a similar way or is, this, uh, is are these systems useful to study this as well? Please keep it short. Please give a short answer. Yes, indeed, it was already investigated. So uh, mice also have all three uh, chemokines present in their system, and that they were blocked uh, in uh, in vivo in mice. And therefore, we know that uh, PF4, uh, PF4 alt, and run test they are very much involved in the atherosclerosis progression. It has been already proven. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Blanche Schroen. She is Professor of Experimental Cardiology at Maastricht University. And she is also the secretary of this committee. Professor Schroen. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, um, thank you uh, for uh, also involving me in the assessment of your thesis. I've read it with uh, lots of pleasure. And I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team on this beautiful work. Now, I would like to discuss with you chapter five, which is on the deposition of platelet-relevant chemokines uh, onto the endothelial cells and the impact uh, that has on uh, leukocyte arrest. Um, you chose uh, two chemokines that are abundant in platelets, huh? and we have heard a lot about them already, uh, CCL5 and CXCL4. And um, I would like to uh, ask you some questions on your experimental setup. And then also hope to discuss some, uh, some uh, topics that are close to my heart, uh, which are, uh, of course, heart failure. Um, but first, the setup. Um, you uh, exogenously add uh, the two chemokines to the uh, endothelial cells in culture. Um, and that, in my very simple understanding, uh, excludes a role for platelets and the type of chemokine uh, deposition. Um, on endothelial cells. So I was wondering what your take is on the role of platelets and how they, what role they play and the, the type of deposition of chemokines onto endothelial cells. So highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your nice, nice comments. Uh, and indeed, I studied the monocyte arrest on endothelial cells. Uh, and you are asking about the involvement of platelets themselves in this process. Uh, so platelets can uh, adhere, so um, it can uh, interact with endothelial cells by uh, cell adhesion molecules, such as, for example, uh, E-selectin or P-selectin. Also, uh, if the interactions uh, involving um, integrin alpha to be beta 3 were shown uh, in the literature. So. Uh, this, these um, cell adhesion molecules allow rolling of platelets onto endothelial cells. And then once they are in close proximity to, to the cell membrane, they, they can basically deposit those chemokines on the cell uh, that then can be taken up or not by endothelial cells. Um, because we also know that uh, not in my case, all run tests were uh, was uh, taken up, but uh, by endothelial cells. But for example, uh, part of uh, platelet factor four stays on the surface mm -hmm. uh, because it has a very high affinity to glucosaminoglycans, uh, and we know that those are core receptors uh, for the binding, uh, mm -hmm. and may play even different roles uh, on the surface that we previously thought about. Yes, so the question is indeed, and you, I mean, there's no way to answer that uh, right now, is uh, what role platelets play in uh, the deposition uh, in relation to the glycoaminoglycans, and if it's any different when uh, the platelets are in close proximity to, to the endothelial cells or 
when you uh, just put uh, the chemokines in the solution. Um, but I'm I'm really curious uh, how, how that would affect their uh, positioning on the on the cells. But then um, you remove the uh, the gags and uh, are surprised that uh, the um, uh, internalization or the uptake of these chemokines increases. Uh, and why were you surprised? Uh, yes. Um, so normally uh, we believe that uh, those glucosaminoglycans are coreceptors and they uh, basically help binding and help internalizing of the chemokines. And indeed, when, once we removed uh, glucosaminoglycans by enzymatic treatment, yeah. we uh, saw the increased uptake of Rantes. Yeah, yeah, I always envisioned it as, as some sort of like uh, uh, sugar coating uh, uh, to cells that would actually mask their internalization uh, of, of- It is, of but then we, we also think that maybe uh, even though that there was enzymatic treatment, uh, then the remnants of those uh, glucosaminoglycans were uh, enough to uh, allow the uptake of uh, rantus into endothelial cells. Or uh, another possibility is that, uh, that our uh, enzymes didn't cleave the glucosaminoglycans as we hoped for, and that is why uh, we observed uh, the uptake anyway. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's possible indeed. It's still a cell system. Huh? Um, and then in figure eight, uh, you also treat the cells with uh, with heparin. Um, what what does heparin do in this setup? Can you explain that? Yes, briefly? of course. So I briefly mentioned it, that heparin is a highly negatively charged molecules mm -hmm. and plated factor four also run tests, but especially plated factor four, they are highly positive in charge. And the uh, affinity for binding of heparin and uh, PF4 and Rantes is huge. Uh, and that is why we use this uh, feature to remove all remnants of chemokines from the cell, the cell surface. Uh, if we want to, for example, perform uh, um, microscopic analysis or ELISA. So that because if the chemokines were attached to the cell surface, uh, then, uh, of course, the results of our uh, experiments would be uh, a little bit um, yeah. uh, untrue because of that. Sense, yeah. But do you mean all, because I'm not a chemokine expert, do you mean all chemokines, also other ones? Uh, so you, the ones that, that, that have the, the highly positive charge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I'm a bit puzzled by your conclusion. You say... Um, let me see, at least uh, these two chemokines require surface expression or presentation for leukocyte recruitment, but... Um, yes, I know what you mean, uh, but uh, because in the, um, in the introduction we say, uh, of this experiment, we say that um, it has been found already that certain chemokines are able to uh, be stored underneath in vesicles underneath the uh, endothelial cells. So this was our hypothesis that we assume that our chemokines could be stored intracellularly in endothelial cells in those in vesicles sense. and yeah. thereby uh, we uh, got rid of the chemokines from the cell surface. Indeed, yeah. I uh, I see my time is already up. Um, haven't come to my most important question, but that's fine. I'm happy with your answers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Schoen. Um, the next opponent is uh, Dr. Claudia Goetsch. She is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and Group Leader of Cardiology. Thank you, dear Prorector, dear candidate. Uh, first of all, congratulations to your thesis. And I would actually try to ask my first question around your topic on chemokines and extracellular vesicles. In chapter four and five, you used the soluble form of the chemokines to stimulate your cells. So now it's actually also known that chemokines can also be loaded into extracellular vesicles and fulfill their function in this way. So my first question would be, can CXCL4 be a cargo of EVs? And if yes, which subtype would this be? Which EV subtype? 
Yes, so indeed you are completely right. Uh, it is now very well known that uh, chemokines are the cargo of extracellular vesicles. Um, and your question is about which type of vesicle contain yeah. those. Yeah, so, so in your introduction, you kind of mentioned that we have different kinds depending yes. on the biogenesis. So what, what is known which type of vesicles would be loaded with CXCL4? Yes, uh, I know what you mean. So I, I said that there, that there are uh, exosomes, uh, microvesicles, and apoptotic bodies. Uh, so to the best of my knowledge, uh, most um, papers that I've read describe uh, microvesicles as the uh, type of vesicle that contain um, most of the chemokines, uh, also including PF4, PF4 alt, that we don't know much about it because it's a little bit neglected in the literature, but Rantas also can be a cargo of EVs. Okay. Uh, so then like having that said, what would you think would be, or would you expect differences in terms of function when CXCL4 is loaded into extracellular vesicles independent of the type and using the soluble form? So now you use the soluble form, put it in other words, what would you expect if you have the cytokine loaded in extracellular vesicles? Yes. So, uh... Of course, uh, when the chemokine is loaded in, uh, in a vesicle, it, uh, it forms a much more complicated structure. And so then a, cer a certain um, composition of uh, integrins or other receptors on the vesicles can have, so can find the uh, the matching co-receptors on other cell types, right? Mm -hmm. So that th this is the, uh, the condition. So if there is no match, then probably they won't be taken up by this particular cell type because uh, EVs are released by any cell type basically in the body. And then when we add the soluble form, then we don't have this problem uh, because if we know that the molecule has, has the receptor matching, matching receptor on the cell surface, that it, it, it will come in uh, the cell. Yeah, so, so it's really depending on the receptor, kind of receptors on this EVs to taking up, if it's receptor mediated uptake on the target cell. I would believe so. Yeah, so, so let's stay with the vesicles and go to chapter six. So in chapter six, you isolated the EVs by um, one centrifugation step by 20,000 G. So now we know at, in, in the field that we can enrich different EV subtypes by differential centrifugation. So my question is, would you expect a difference in, in, in collagen production or proliferation if you use large or small extracellular vesicles, um, like if you use other subtypes, because you only performed one centrifugation step here? Yeah, that's a, that's a relevant question indeed, um, uh, because there are many types of uh, isolating EVs. Uh, the one that we used is the simplest one uh, because it just uh, one step centrifugate, ultra centrifugation and we get all types of EVs there. Um, of course, it's possible to in include also density gradient or size exclusion chromatography uh, so that then we uh, discriminate uh, between those microvesicles and exosomes, for example. And we could indeed try to divide this, uh, this, the whole population into do two subpopulations and check um, and perform this, the same experiment and check whether there is a difference or not. Because I think that. Um, because one, we can would ex one would expect a different cargo in these EVs depending on the size or like yes. depending on the subtype. We could expect a difference in the cargo, of course, uh, because the. Um, the secretion, the mechanism of secretion of EVs and exosomes are different. Once one is uh, the, the membrane uh, shedding, the me membrane budding, and the other one is through multivesicular bodies. Uh, so that could indeed affect the cargo. Yeah. And, and staying with the cargo, so you in like in chapter six, you showed 
the effect of these hepatocyte EVs on proliferation in, in collagen production. Mm -hmm. Do you think what are what are these type of cargos which mediates this effect? Uh, so you're uh, asking about the collagen. Yeah, or what are in these EVs? So there are different molecules, different cargo molecules in these EVs, different types. So what do you think would be the effector mediating collagen production, for example? Yes, so of course, uh, there is a myriad of different factors inside the EV, as I mentioned in my presentation. So those are uh, also uh, microRNAs um, mm -hmm. and then definitely can interfere with the, uh, the uh, recipient cell uh, and then therefore uh, change the expression of a particular gene, for example, in case of collagen, that might be the case also, but in this uh, particular work, we didn't uh, check for mRNA okay. uh, expression. Thank you so much for answering all these questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goetz. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Armand Jaminot. He is Associate Professor of Biochemistry at Maastricht University. Dr. Jaminot. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, also I want to congratulate you with your work, with your thesis. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. I also want to congratulate, of course, the promotion team as they uh, were heavily involved. So my first question would relate to a statement. So could you please read statement 10 to me? Statement 10. A man is as old as his arteries. Thomas Sendeham. Yes. So this, my question relates actually also to Professor Lumen's question. Uh, so do you think that your statement or your proposition that you here mention is still very actual? Uh, it is known that it is actual because it, uh, it appears uh, all the time during the various presentations uh, when the cardiologists, for example, uh, make those, pres those presentations. Uh, and yes, uh, it is quite an old statement, uh, but uh, still the underlying mechanisms are very true uh, to, till this date, because uh, when arteries age, then there is endothelial dysfunction, then there is intimate thickening, elastin degeneration of the media, there is accumulation of collagen, there, there's... Uh, development of atherosclerosis in the end yes, so I all agree. those i agree with your uh, with your statement but there was an underlying uh, reasoning behind it of course because it states specifically men and uh, that is related to the biological point of view so do you think that your research currently that you were conducting uh, was also then applying to the rules to men or do you consider maybe a gender difference uh, as important as well so you mean uh, gender differences? Perhaps. Yes, it was my aim. I was aiming for that, that you would go to that. But... <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't get that. So sorry. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, so thinking logically, there should be a difference uh, between uh, men and women. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is a different a difference of uh, hormones uh, in, in both genders that might very well affect the uh, aging of uh, arteries uh, during the, this, uh, the cardiovascular diseases as well. Uh, so... Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I think this is understudied a bit and we currently are not looking much into that, right? But anyway, I want to continue to chapter four and want to look into my favorite cell type, of course, which is the some vascular small muscle cells. Um, so could you go to your figure one uh, at page 58? So there you show the CXCL4 uptake or of, uh, of both variants, right? So the, the C4 and, and the L1 variant. Uh, but what I was surprised to see is actually that you use a negative control antibody which is specific for the l1 but you don't show the staining 
for the L1 when you do the uptake experiment. So is there a reasoning for this? Because for me, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so the reason for that is that at the beginning of this research, we only were able to use uh, one antibody against platelet factor four. That means that uh, this the standard, let's call it standard antibody, couldn't distinguish between PF4 and PF4 out. So, and this is also, I, I think, the common thing in other papers that uh, authors state that they investigated PF4, but they use uh, the antibody that recognizes both factors. And then they really cannot distinguish whether it's PF4 native or PF4 out. And we were fortunate enough that uh, at, the, uh, at the end of our study, we found this antibody that, that was indeed um, specific for uh, PF4 out. And then uh, a lot of our results became uh, more uh, clear. Uh, so, um, uh, precisely because of uh, this particular staining, we say that uh, vascular smooth muscle cells are able to exogenously, pro endogenously produce uh, platelet factor 4 out and not native PF4, which is for a reason. And then only native platelet 4 is internalized by the cells and not PF4 out, which also is there for a reason. And we try to explain it in a way, uh, in this way that um, uh, this constitutive expression of alt, so the, ver the variant, is there um, to control the aberrant uh, angiogen, uh, the proliferation and angiogenesis of endothelial cells. So uh, alt would be released by uh, vascular smooth muscle cells into neighboring uh, extracellular matrix and then affect endothelial cells when where they are uh, slowing down the proliferation uh, and keeping uh, the endothelial cells in a quiescent state. So that is our uh, reasoning for that. Yes, yes, thank you for, uh, for this elaborate answer. <laughs> I want to maybe ask a short question, uh, so which is related to figure three. And there you use this heparin, I think also Professor Schoon already mentioned it. And we use the heparin usually to contract our cells, right, as you did in this experiment as well. And then you mentioned that the other way of making cells contractile by using low serum, um, that does it, that, that com uh, completely uh, reacts to a different in your setup. So could you explain me how this works? But can you be short? Yes, yeah, so indeed we used here two different approaches to induce contractile uh, phenotype of vascular smooth muscle cells uh, because the, the reasoning behind this experiment was to uh, check whether uh, contractile or synthetic phenotype, uh, whether the composition of extracellular... Uh, I know the reason. Can you be specific on what the difference is between two contractile cells? That Yes, yeah, so, so uh, heparin. So heparin, for example, uh, decreases uh, the ERK signaling pathway in uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. It has a direct, uh, recently shown receptor of, of uh, on uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. Uh, so it can go directly and it can slow down the transdifferentiation. Uh, then we have uh, very low serum levels that we also use. Uh, this is uh, another way of inducing contractile uh, phenotype. And then we uh, saw that only heparin uh, was able to completely block the uptake of PF4, uh, which uh, basically disproved our hypothesis that uh, how the, in general, contractile vascular smooth muscle cells doesn't take up, do not take up the uh, chemokines. It turned out that this was this effect was only heparin specific. Yes, thank you uh, for your answers. I'm happy with your answers. I give the word back to the collect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jamino. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Stein Achter. He is assistant professor at the Department of Biochemistry at Maastricht University. Dr. Achter. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidates, I would also like to congratulate you and your promotion team with finishing this piece of work. Uh, I've focused on 
chemokines during my own PhD and I'm now focusing on calcification so I could find a lot of overlap within your thesis. And because I'm a protein chemist, I would like to uh, explore the proteins you used in your in your thesis. Um, starting off in, in chapters four and five, you used um, PF4 and PF4 alt uh, from different uh, sources. So PF4 was isolated from uh, platelet packs. PF4 alt was uh, expressed using a recombinant system. And in chapter five, you used a re uh, commercial recombinant PF4. And I would like to um, ask you what the differences between these uh, sources are and why you used all these different sources. Well, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for uh, your comments. Uh, yes, you are completely right. We used uh, different sources of the chemokines. Um, uh, the true reason for that is it, it was uh, easier uh, for us at the certain uh, time point of my uh, research use uh, to use uh, a commercial version. Uh, because you can basically uh, buy them uh, through the manufacturer. And then second of all, when I was more advanced, uh, we uh, were able to uh, express uh, and I I isolate uh, platelet factor four from platelet packs, as you mentioned. Uh, so um, from outdated uh, platelet packs. And then uh, referring to the differences between the commercial and uh, the isolating uh, isolated one um, there should not be that much difference uh, because we performed uh, during the isolation we performed all the steps necessary to obtain the pure protein uh, and this the the composition of amino acids is also uh, the same as uh, the one the commercial one uh, so I think that in this respect, there, there should not be uh, too many differences. And we obtain the pure protein at the end. So did you test the differences between the... No, exper experimentally, we didn't test the differences because we assumed that they would be different, uh, similar. Okay. Then in your um, recombinant uh, expressed BF4 alt, the M-terminal methionine residue is retained. Um, according to you, this does not have uh, any function, does not affect the function of PF4 alt. How have you tested this? Uh, we haven't tested this my, uh, ourselves. Uh, we just use the uh, literature evidence uh, saying that uh, this methionine uh, residue does not affect the function of PF4 alt. So, are you familiar not... with? Um, the methionine retained on um, CCL5, so Ramtis, a chemokine that you also used, and what effects that has on the chemokine? Uh, we think that uh, it also doesn't affect this function because when the... Uh... Well, I can interrupt you. Uh, so methionine on CCL5, the one residue retained, changes CCL5 from an agonist into an antagonist. So it can have a huge effect. And the reason I'm asking this for PF4, of course, is because uh, PF4 has some obscure functions, some of which you have now found in your thesis. And I was wondering if these obscure functions could be due to this methionine that is retained in your preparation. Um, I would like to continue uh, on uh, the tetramerization of PF4. So we know that PF4 tetramerizes in solution. Um, is this also true for PF4 alt? Uh, yes, this is also true. And the oligomerization uh, depends on uh, pH, for example. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we know that PF4 uh, tetramerizes, uh, but PF4 out can form dimers, trimers, and hexamers. Uh, and the, um, so it, it forms more strong dimers than native PF4 because it has uh, less positive charge 
uh, than the native version. And then the, those dimers are stronger. And then also because of this, uh, PF4Alt forms um, low, uh, like lower amount of uh, het heteromers in the solution okay. uh, because of this. And, uh, and do you uh, know if PF4 and PF4Alt can also fit on mixed? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that is my that was always my question and we were wondering about it i didn't find any scientific uh proof for that so i to the best of my knowledge we don't know and liter literature doesn't describe it we know so that in your they, experiments um you only added pf4 or pf4 alt alone yes that's why correct. did you not mix the two and see what happened uh, this this would be another level of complexity uh, to this experiment, and since I struggled uh, a little bit with uh, obtaining the good results, with uh... as you will have noticed, uh, Mr. Katsor, the time for defending your thesis has passed, and uh, the committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and, in particular, the quality of your defense. So please await our return with the results of our deliberation. Thank you.
Dear Mr. Kachor, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of this positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you a degree of doctor. And Professor Hacking is authorized to confer upon you his academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom and law. Professor Hacking, may I invite you to take the floor? Dear candidate David Katsour, are you ready to make the pledge? Do Not at all. <laughs> Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I do. By the authority vested in me by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, David Katsour, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university, as shown now by the beadle. Thank you very much. Esteemed colleague, dear Dr. Katsour, it is my honor and pleasure to congratulate you as a first with your recent and fine doctoral degree. I would like to also uh, congratulate your family and friends and all your colleagues online with your recent achievement. Finally, express special thanks and gratitude to Dr. Gutsch and Professor Gerdes for taking part in this ceremony of your defense. And with that, I would like to hand over the word to your promoter, uh, Dr. Koenen. Thank you, thank you. And I'm um, adjusting my screen for a second, so now I have everything ready. Dear David, the moment has arrived. Hora est has sounded. And during these few minutes, David Katschor has transformed into Dr. David Katschor. And I can see in the screen that your name has already been adjusted. Just as easy as that. And although the road towards your PhD has been rocky, and I'm just going to see where you are because I pinned you, but I don't see you on my screen anymore. Where are you? Oh, everybody's on the screen except you. I'm just going to continue reading then. Um, I think that the final result is one to be very proud of. It's some five years ago that I started the selection procedure for the Intercare PhD students or in the EU terminology, early career researchers. I had done an initial round of video meetings first. And I can remember sitting in my living room of my former house, left with a good feeling when closing my laptop after our Zoom meeting. You were friendly, modest, and outgoing. And not unimportantly, you were employed at the Laboratory of Experimental Pharmacology of Endothelium, JSET, at the Jagiellonian, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. This institute, led by Professor Stefan Klopitschki, has an excellent reputation in the field of vascular and endothelial biology. Okay. So, um, so I decided to invite you for a personal interview at Maastricht University. I also involved my three PhD students in the selection process procedure, since they were also they were work together with you as well. You showed a presentation during which you presented a broad spectrum of techniques and methods. And you were so honest to say that some being work in progress did not work yet. In general, you made a very good impression. I believe that I had two candidates on my final shortlist. And after consulting my PhD students, Anamik, Alexandra and Tanya, all agreed and were also very happy to have you in our team. After your arrival, you were quickly engaged in a number of projects, and I have to confess, they were all quite challenging. Since the focus was on extracellular vesicles and cell-to-cell -cell communication, um, we looked for a way to measure platelet-to-platelet -to -platelet and platelet-to-endothelial communication. 
And since there was a paper in which was demonstrated that platelets could be transfected with DNA to express proteins, we tried it out with a plasmid coding for Cre recombinase. But after a quite a number of attempts and equally painful fails, we had to conclude that it was not possible in our hands. Then we tried to make a lentiviral reporter vector to make endothelial cells sensitive to Cre expression so that we could measure vesicle uptake in these cells. You grew to be quite an expert in plasmid isolation, cell transfection, microscopy, and virus quantitation. And you proactively consulted many people to get help. But unfortunately, this project did not have any usable results as well. And although you were in excellent company with this, since Anemic didn't succeed as well, at least in getting the, um, the reporter uh, cells done, this, of course, did not help your confidence in the entire project. But in the meantime, you were progressive, progressing, albeit not very obvious. You were successfully working on an exocellular vase, a vesicle uh, isolation protocol from blood plasma. And we were about to send you to Aachen for your secondment. You were also making a good start with your smooth muscle cell, muscle cell calcification experiments, later more you had made a lot of arrangements to make, the jump of, uh, to make the jump to Aachen, and you were at the brink of moving, but then it happened. The infamous coronavirus virus broke out. So we needed to put these plans on ice. This was a setback, as it blocked many plans for going abroad to secondments and congresses. But perhaps it was also the turning point. We were forced to focus on the essentials. You started to concentrate on the calcification of smooth muscle cells due to the action of platelet factor 4. Since you have also made a lot of recombinant platelet factor 4 and platelet factor 4 alt, and you also isolated it from plasma, you were in an excellent occasion to compare these two variants. And since you were working together very productively with Anouk and with Anamik, data started rolling in. At last, we found a way that would lead to the completion of your PhD. And in the meantime, you had become a very versatile and good experimenter. So it turned out that the experiments you did, uh, that you did led to usable results. And finally, we ended up writing down all the findings. Your main manuscript leading to the, uh, leading to the about quickest publication in my career. Submission at the end of November, about one year ago, and acceptance before New Year 2022. Since I'm a bit older, I have seen more PhD tracks than you. And from my perspective, your PhD didn't go that bad at all. And as I always emphasized, you have quite some qualities that make you a good researcher. Let me sum them up. You're quite resilient. Sure, you've had your problems and worries, and you've communicated those worries with me, but you have kept going on without quitting or collapsing. You are analytically and emotionally smart in a sense that you understand complicated concepts quickly and you are a kind, loyal, and communicative person who can easily get assistance from colleagues. You are a good, very good data miner, and you have surprised me more than once by finding relevant literature from the internet that I myself had never seen. And you are a good writer, which was instrumental in getting your PhD thesis ready in record time, record time as well. But truth has to be told, there are also some points of advice that I would like to give you, uh, to you in your further career path. First of all, make friends with things that are outside of your comfort zone. Embrace such things as occasions to learn. And even if these things lead to failure, you learn in the process. Second, think positively. You have seen in the final year of your PhD that many things turn to the good. There are many ways to success. And third, don't think too much. Just do it. The worst thing that can happen is failure. And even then, the return is experience. Finally, I would like to spend the last few words about the formal, final, for, formal finalization of your thesis. I believe that these were emotionally taxing times, and it, and it has put our understanding to the test. Finding a solution has cost us quite some energy, and even after, after rounding it up, I think we can both agree that although universities often have the pretension to be places of innovation, 
they sometimes rather tend to be bureaucratic and rigid government uh, agencies. I hope that the sentiments of the final months can be set aside and that we can celebrate your thesis as an excellent result. And well, all well. I would like to thank also the PhD team, Professor Hacking and Professor Kramon, and congratulations to you, your family, friends, and loved ones. And aloud, Stolat, Stolat, Nam. Congratulations, David. Thank you, Rory, for this nice recap of my PhD and also for your advice at the end. Thanks. Oh. Can you understand me? Can you yes. hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, esteemed Dr. Kachov, dear David, I would like to congratulate you with the doctorate that you acquired and the honor that you acquired today. And I do that also on behalf of Maastricht University, in particular, the Board of Deans. And I would like to share some impressions of the degree committee with you. Um, we have seen a good and very well written thesis, um, which has covered a wide field of biomedical processes, and it has well published studies. And we are very satisfied with your defense. You have um, shown to be very knowledgeable in the field of your studies, although we had, of course, sometimes to focus a little bit more the discussion, and we would have uh, liked to discuss somewhat more in the key concepts. But we consider your thesis as, as, as very good, and we appreciate uh, the knowledge that you have showed to us today. Um, I congratulate your three supervisors, uh, Professor Tilman Hacking, uh, Dr. Rory Kuhne, and Professor Rafael Kraman. You may be proud of what we have seen today in terms of uh, a good thesis, um, very good studies, uh, a good defense, and I hope that you are proud, and I'm sure that you are pr proud, on the young Dr. Gracho. And of, of course, I want to include in my congratulations your, um, your parents, uh, your family, and all your friends and colleagues and all those who have contributed to your studies and the outcome that we have seen today. And of course, I wish you um, a successful professional career and a happy personal life. Um, then I would like to thank the members of the uh, degree committee and of the thesis assessment committee. Thank you very much for all your work, your input, um, your critical reading, and in particular, I would like to thank the external members uh, and also, of course, all opponents for their questions and interesting the academic discussions. Uh, Maastricht University appreciates your contribution. Thank you very much. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony.